morning, everyone. Um, I'm Tom Hucker. I'm president of the Montgomery County Council. I'm serving in my sixth year on the County Council. Um, it's really wonderful to be here at the Montgomery County History Conference. Thanks so much um, to Matt Logan and um, all, all of you at Montgomery History for bringing us together um, and especially for what everything you do all, all year long. It's critical that we study and understand our local history. You all appreciate that better than uh, anyone else in the county. It guides us. It informs the decisions that my colleagues and I make on a daily basis. Um, you know how rich Montgomery County is with history. Um, and by understanding it, we understand how, um, how the county that we inhabit uh, was created, evolved. Uh, we can separate wise and fair uh, decisions that have stood the test of time that were made by our predecessors from inequitable decisions. Um, and we can try to correct for that. Um, so we don't repeat our past mistakes and we can make more informed decisions going forward. But that work isn't possible without your work to study and document and educate all of us about our history. So that's why I'm so grateful for your work. My colleagues are, um, and I'm really um, happy to be part of events like today. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Potter. He's an accomplished and well-respected leader in the field of archeology, span especially in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, I am looking forward to hearing his remarks. I'm sure you are as well. Please join me in welcoming him to the Montgomery County History Conference of 2021. Thank you. And my apologies. So I'm going to zap myself because uh, I prefer being behind the lens, not in front of it. Uh, thank you all for your patience. Uh, thank you both Matt's and it's a real privilege and pleasure to have been asked to speak today. Before I begin my formal presentation. And Dr. Potter, can you move just a little bit closer to your microphone? Sure. Before I begin my formal presentation, three words require definition. The first two of which are often confused by the media. Algonquian and Algonquian with a K or Algonquin, and here you can see the differences between the two. Algonquian refers to a great North American Indian language family with two branches, Eastern Algonquian, spoken by peoples from the Canadian Maritimes to North Carolina along the Atlantic coast, and immediately inland from it, and Central Algonquian, spoken by peoples farther west in the interior. Algonquin is the name of an ethnic group who lived north of the St. Lawrence River in the Ottawa Valley of Canada. To confuse things further, they also speak a dialect of Eastern Algonquia. Be that as it may, no Quins ever lived in the Chesapeake Bay. The third word needing definition is chiefdom. Simply put, it is a pyramid of power with the paramount chief at the top of the pyramid. The rulers of the local chiefdoms who paid allegiance to the paramount chief below him. And finally, the village chiefs at the bottom. In 1607, the year the English built James Fort in Virginia, the Potomac River below the falls was a central place, <clears throat> unifying some of the Algonquin speaking peoples along its banks and a borderland, a zone of contention between developing political factions. This aboriginal political frontier was exploited by the invading English as they thought uh, to enlist some of the Potomac River chiefdoms as allies in their struggles with the Powhatans. To understand the development of the Anglo-Algonquian frontier, we must first put the native political landscape in perspective. Let's begin with a tale of two towns, Nakachtank and Patawomet. Nakachtank, located along the Anacostia River within modern Washington, D.C., translates to at the trading town. Patawomet, located farther downriver at the junction of Potomac Creek and the Potomac River, translates as trading center. The territory controlled by the Werowances, or chiefs, of both villages lay to the east of the fall line and straddled the great natural trade route of the Potomac River, connecting Chesapeake Bay 
and the Appalachian Mountains. Nakotchtank and Patawomic probably function something like gateway communities, affording the rural ones an opportunity to influence long distance trade, whether going up or down the river. Sometime prior to 1608, the Nakotchtanks and Patawomics had been ancient allies, members of a larger polity that included five groups in Maryland and two in Virginia. According to Piscataway oral tradition, this chiefdom was led by a paramount leader, the Tayac of the Piscataways, who was vested with some degree of centralized power and authority. Apparently, competition over trade, among other things, caused the Patawomics to break away from the larger polity. When contacted by Captain John Smith in June of 1608, they were at war with the Tanks and Piscataways. The rulers of the Potomac River chiefdoms had other concerns too, caused by Powhatan, the paramount or peace chief of the largest and most centralized Southern Algonquian chiefdom. Sometime during the latter part of the 16th century, Powhatan inherited six to nine local chiefdoms along the James and York rivers, driven by certain prophecies related by his priest that, quote, from the Chesapeake Bay, a nation should arise, which should dissolve and give in to his empire, end quote, Powhatan expanded his chiefdom eastward to the coast. By the end of 1608, through intimidation and warfare, Powhatan's core area consisted of most of the local chiefdoms between the falls of the James and York Rivers and Chesapeake Bay. The rapid expansion of the Powhatan chiefdom made the local chiefdoms of the lower Rappahannock River uneasy. Consequently, many of the villagers moved from the south to the north bank of the Rappahannock to sites like this one, shown with that sort of grayish brown stain that you see adjacent to the water in the agricultural field, putting the river between them and Powhatan's imperial ambitions. When Smith explored the area in 1608, only seven villages shown in red here were observed along the Rappahannock's southern bank, while an astounding 35 villages were seen on the northern one. Archaeologically, research by Michael Klein supports the notion that the number of villages along the Rappahannock's north bank increased late in prehistory. In 1607, Relationships between Indian groups in the Chesapeake Bay region consisted of a complex web of trade and military alliances, raids, and warfare. When viewed from the Potomac River, the situation looked something like this. To the north were the Iroquoian-speaking Susquehannocks, who lived along the lower Susquehanna River that claimed as their territory the entire Susquehanna Valley vast areas on either side of Chesapeake Bay, and a hunting and trapping preserve that stretched to the upper Potomac where archaeological evidence of satellite villages has been found near Moorefield and Romney, West Virginia. Susquehannock raiding parties were striking the villages of Algonquian-speaking peoples along with the Tuxen and Potomac Rivers. Somewhere to the northwest were the enigmatic Iroquoian-speaking Massawomics who had, quote, so many men, they made war with all the world, end quote. The Massawomics were busy trading with some eastern shore groups in the Tangier Sound region while attacking their mortal enemies and linguistic cousins, the Susquehannocks, as well as the Tuklaws and other Indian groups near the head of Chesapeake Bay, the Algonquians of the Tuxen and Potomac Rivers, and the Siouan-speaking Manahoacs of North Central Piedmont, Virginia. The Manahoacs and their Siouan-speaking Confederates, the Monacans of the Middle James Valley, were warring with and occasionally trading with the Algonquians living near the fall line along the Rappahannock and James Rivers. South of the tidal Rappahannock was the heartland of Powhatan's paramount chiefdom. Concentrated along the tidal York and James Rivers, with its western boundary against the fall line frontier, separating them from the Monacans. 
groups along the south bank of the Potomac River, the Rappahannock River, and the Accomox and Okahannox of Virginia's eastern shore were part of Powhatan's ethnic fringe, as ethno-historian Helen Roundtree has described it. Peripheral chiefdoms strongly influenced, but not absolutely dominated by Powhatan. Beyond the York and James Rivers, Powhatan's authority diminished as the distance from the center of his chiefdom increased, a fact quickly understood by the Jamestown settlers. Not long after failed attempts to destroy or dislodge the English invaders in May 1607, Powhatan changed his strategy. If he couldn't drive the aliens away with arrows, he'd win them over with maize. In exchange for Powhatan maize, the English traded, quote, copper, white beads, hatchets, hoes, knives, and such like, end quote. Of all those items, it was copper that Powhatan and the Werewolves coveted most. Among the Southern Algonquians, copper was a symbol of power and authority. European copper was particularly prized because it was redder and harder than native varieties. With the advent of the strangers at Jamestown, suddenly Powhatan had a potential new source of high-grade copper. There were also <clears throat> the weapons of the Englishmen, which might be used against Powhatan's enemies if the strangers were made his allies. Perhaps it's for those reasons that Powhatan allowed Jamestown to survive. By 1609, though, things had turned sour with the trade in corn and copper. Recent archaeological excavations at Jamestown uncovered abundant, quote, copper scraps, the trimmings from the English manufacture of trade goods, and one of the most commonly found items at the site, end quote. The greatest quantity of copper occurs in deposits dating to the earliest years of the settlement, the same time period that visiting merchant sailors and some of the English colonists were flooding the local natives with copper. As archaeologist William Kelso and his colleagues note, quote, flooding Powhatan society with copper items devalued the metal and upset the native social order. Copper no longer distinguished chiefs from their followers. In fact, this disruption in the balance of the copper trade contributed to the overall deterioration of English Powhatan relations. End quote. With copper aplenty, Powhatan now asked for English arms in exchange for Indian maize. Unwilling to trade in arms and backed by a new charter charging the English colonists with, quote, the conversion and reduction of the native people in those parts unto the true worship of God and Christian religion, end quote, the Jamestown government began the first Anglo-Powhatan War of 1609-1614 to destroy the Powhatan's priesthood and obtain the corn by force. For most of the next four decades, members of the Powhatan chiefdom and their English neighbors engaged in, quote, vengeful, perpetual war, end quote. As Anglo-Indian relations on the James and York rivers were being forged in the crucible of war, English relations took a different turn with those natives farther from both the English and the Palatans. In May 1609, members of the Virginia Company of London advised the Jamestown leaders, if you make friendship with any of these nations, as you must do, Choose to do it with those that are farthest from you and enemies unto those among whom you dwell. Advice became policy and distance from English settlements, the means of distinguishing Indian friend from foe. Hastening to put policy into action, Captain Samuel Argyll established a lucrative trade with the Werewants of Potomac. Quote, a person of great interest and authority throughout the whole Potomac River, end quote, who ruled almost 1,000 people and 10 villages. Over the next several years, Argyll traded English trifles for great quantities of corn. Just as important, in 1612, he sealed a defensive military alliance with the Potomacs against the Powhatans. 
Shortly after, the Powhatans made peace with their ancient Piedmont enemies, the Monacans. Yet Argyll's greatest coup in the maize trade with the Potomacs occurred in 1613, when he succeeded in kidnapping Pocahontas, one of Powhatan's daughters. This action helped force an end to the First Anglo-Powhatan War. And of course, if this had never happened, Walt Disney would never have made oodles of noodle off of his movies, uh, telling his spin on Pocahontas' story. The maize trade with the Potomac River Indians slackened after the end of the war in 1614, as the colonists became more self-sufficient, viewing the cessation of hostilities as an opportunity to Christianize the Indians the Virginia Company of London promoted the metamorphosis of Algonquians into Anglicans, while the Virginia English promoted tobacco production. As the profitable tobacco market grew during the next seven years, English land acquisition and Christian missionary efforts helped trigger the Second anglo palatan War of 1622 to 1632. Acutely aware of the Potomac's invaluable services in the past and their non-participation in Opakan Canoe's attack of March 22, 1622, the Jamestown government realized the necessity of maintaining good relations with those Indians who were not in league with Opakan Canoe, Powhatan's successor. In 1622, the English built a fort adjacent to the village of Potomac and the Werewants provided 40 or 50 choice bowmen to conduct and assist the English in a raid to seas made from the Patawomac's enemies and the Koch tanks. Near Summer's End, though, the beneficial alliance with the Patawomac's was severed for a time when Captain Isaac Madison rashly uh, acted on false information and brutally killed 30 or 40 Patawomac's. The following March, Captain Henry Spellman and 19 colonists were killed while on a training voyage to the Potomac River, somewhere near modern Washington, D.C. Although there's been considerable debate over who committed the deed, the Nacotch tanks or the Patawomics, the one man who lived to write about it, Henry Fleet, blamed the Nacotch tanks. Regardless of the group responsible, Virginia Governor Sir Francis Wyatt sought to renew the alliance with the Potomacs by leading an expedition against their enemies, the Nacotch tanks and Piscataways. By the fall of 1623, the English and Potomacs were allies once again, and the maize trade resumed. Archaeologically, the importance of the English Potomac alliance is apparent in the 1869 discovery at Potomac Neck, Virginia, of a high-status early 17th century native burial site. Among the items associated with one of the 12 skeletons in the grave were five shell mass gorgettes, five circular shell gorgettes, six circular and six rectangular copper gorgettes, glass, copper, and shell beads, brass bells, and a white metal cross. Benefiting from their experience in the maize trade of the 1620s, individuals like Henry Fleet and William Claiborne saw the profit to be had from pelts. I've always loved this image. <clears throat> this is a period image done by a French artist who obviously had never seen a uh, beaver hut. And I, I love the fact that it looks like a condo for beavers. It's uh, rather amusing. By 1630, as the Second anglo powhatan War was slowly coming to an end on the James and York Rivers, the beaver trade began in the Potomac Valley. Fleet, who'd learned the local Algonquian language from his five-year captivity by the Nakaj tanks, was ideally suited to trade among the Potomac River Algonquians. His former captors, the Nakaj tanks, were now under the protection of the Massawomics, since they were acting as the Massawomics middlemen in the fur trade. This strange partnership began sometime in the late 1620s after the Nikoi 
and the way chiefdom suffered severe losses from Massawomit attacks. Claiborne, meanwhile, left the Potomac River to flee while he looked for pelts in the northern Chesapeake, aided by Susquehannock friends and a royal trading patent granted in 1631. The following year, the decade-long war between the Powhatans and the Virginia English finally ended. Unfortunately, peace had a short lifespan on the 17th century Chesapeake frontier. The spark that ignited the new conflict was the founding of the colony of Maryland at St. Mary City in 1634. Ironically, Sir George Calvert heard of Claiborne's fur trading visit, a venture while visiting in Virginia. Wanting a piece of the action and a Southern proprietary, Sir George applied for a royal charter upon returning to England. By the time it was granted, he was dead and his son, Cecil Calvert, became the recipient of a royal charter granting him the northern two-thirds of Chesapeake Bay. Apparently, the people who doled out royal charters and patents didn't realize that Baron Baltimore's charter contradicted William Claiborne's earlier trading patent. That little oversight kept Chesapeake in turmoil for the next quarter century. With the establishment of <clears throat> the Maryland English at uh, St. Mary's uh, City, in the territory of the Kanoe chiefdom, Marylanders competed with Virginians in the search for pelts. Claiborne, upset with Calvert for trying to take over his trade in Virginia's territory, rallied Susquehannock and Virginia allies to his side. Governor Calvert, acutely aware of his colony's vulnerability, sought an alliance with the Kanoes. With no love lost for either the Susquehannocks or the Virginia English, the Kanoes realized the precariousness of their own position and readily agreed to a pact with the Marylanders. In 1637, <clears throat> uh, the Susquehannock's growing concern over a possible Maryland uh, attack against Claiborne's Kent Island trading post in the middle Chesapeake prompted them to give him Palmer's Island near the mouth of the Susquehanna River. Second trading post was soon up and running. All was for naught though, and by the end of 1638, Kent and Palmer's Islands were in Calvert's hands. Counting on the profits to be had from uh, uh, the Susquehannock's beaver pelts, Calvert didn't anticipate their loyalty to their old ally, Claiborne. Rather than trade with those who had uh, fought against their friend. And here you again see Cecil, uh, who was the instigator of much of this turmoil. The Susquehannocks took their pelts overland to the Swedes at newly constructed Fort Christina on the site of present day Wilmington, Delaware. Supplied by both the Swedes and the Dutch, the Susquehannocks in 16. 42 began 10 years of warfare against the Maryland English and their Kanoe allies. To the south, continued colonial expansion along the York and James rivers heightened intercultural tension. This, coupled with Oprah Cancanoe's perception that the Virginia colony was vulnerable due to the English Civil War, triggered the third and final Anglo Powhatan War of 1644 to 1646. At its end, the centralized political power of the Powhatan chiefdom was destroyed, Opracan Canoe was dead, and all Virginia Algonquin groups were made tributary to the colonial government. Meanwhile, William Claiborne had returned to Virginia in 1643 from a self-imposed five-year exile in England. More determined than ever to regain the trade and territory lost to Calvert Claiborne found his task easier when he was restored to his seat on the Virginia Council and, with the outbreak of the Third anglo powhatan War, appointed Virginia's first Major General of Militia. From such powerful positions, Claiborne fought Powhatans in Virginia and fostered the overthrow of fellow Englishmen in Maryland, finally replacing Calvert's government 
with Puritan Confederates in 1652. During depredations against Calvert's colonists and their Kanoa allies, the Susquehannocks availed themselves of the opportunity to trounce other traditional Algonquian enemies. In 1648, they, quote, marched into the king's own colony of Virginia and have carried thence the king of Patawomet prisoner and expelled his and eight other Indian nations in Maryland, civilized and subject to the English crown, end quote. The following year, the Susquehannock's distant allies, the Huron of the Great Lakes, who were backed by the French, were destroyed by the Senecas, one of the five nation Iroquois. The Dutch, not caring where their profits came from, were supplying both the Iroquois and their enemies, the Susquehannocks, with firearms. Two years later, the Mohawks, another member of the five nations, attacked the Susquehannocks but were repulsed. In early 1652, the Iroquois finally gained a victory over the Susquehannocks, prompting the Susquehannocks to quickly make peace with Claiborne's Puritan allies so they could concentrate on their continuing fight with the Iroquois. Unfortunately for Marylanders and Canoes, being friends with the Susquehannocks meant they were automatically enemies to the Iroquois. The end of the Susquehannock Indian War in Maryland and the Third Anglo-Powhatan War in Virginia brought some stability to the two colonies, fostering further settlement along the Potomac. Greater stability and increased settlement among the English caused further instability and displacement among the Algonquians. Although the Potomac River beaver trade continued on a small scale till the 1650s, the majority of new colonists to the area came to raise tobacco. No longer were the Potomac River Algonquians a discrete distance from the English plantations as they were four decades earlier. As the English expanded up the Potomac, international politics made for strange bedfellows and forced a reconsideration of alliances. Angered that the Swedes forcibly closed down their trading post on Delaware Bay, the Dutch retaliated in 1655 and conquered New Sweden. Having just concluded a war with England in 1654, the Dutch were still wary of all those Anglos in Maryland, and rightly so. With his return to power in 1657, Lord Baltimore lost no time in demanding the surrender of the Dutch on Delaware Bay, whom Calvert suspected of instigating the Oneidas, another member of the Five Nation Iroquois, to launch attacks against the Kanoes, allies of Maryland's new buddies, the Susquehannocks. Over the next 17 years, Maryland was obsessed with gaining control of their hoped for northern border on Delaware Bay as its political ownership flip-flopped between the Netherlands and England and New York and Maryland. Remember, there is no province of Pennsylvania yet. It doesn't come into being until 1681. During this time, the Susquehannocks continued their war with the Iroquois. Finally, the Third Anglo-Dutch War ended in 1674, putting Maryland's hope for uh, Delaware Bay on hold. In a bizarre political twist, Governor Calvert invited the Susquehannocks to relocate closer to the Maryland colony. The reasons for this are complicated, but involve Maryland's intentions to make peace with the Five Nation Iroquois, its covert plan to attack the Lenape Delaware, enemies of the Iroquois, allies of the Susquehannocks, and inhabitants of Delaware Bay, and it's sparring with New York's government, Edmund Andrews, over Delaware Bay. In early 1675, coerced by the threat of war with Maryland, the Susquehannocks moved to the site of an abandoned fort on Piscataway Creek in what is now Piscataway Park, Maryland, near the Potomac's fall line frontier. Late in 1675, an attack by Dogue Indians the former Toxinuts of Captain John Smith's day against the encroaching English settlers of Virginia's northern net 
incited the mistaken assault by the frontier militias of Virginia and Maryland on the Susquehannock Fort. Enraged by the Virginia's perfidy and the Marylanders' betrayal, the Susquehannocks began attacking all along the fall line frontier. Their actions helped encourage Nathaniel Bacon's backcountry revolution, which soon became Bacon's Rebellion. At its conclusion, to quote historian Stephen Webb, the fall line frontier of <clears throat> the 17th century disappeared with its native defenders in 1676. It was replaced by a negotiated frontier, a semi-permeable membrane between the Iroquois and English spheres of influence, end quote. Thanks to the precedent set by the great covenant chain of 1676, the 18th century backcountry of Virginia and Pennsylvania would move ever westward, ultimately precipitating the first of America's imperial wars, the French and Indian, which would have unintended consequences for all involved. Thank you so very much for asking me to speak. My apologies again for my technical difficulties at the beginning. And uh, Matt, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Potter. Um, and again, uh, apologize for the little technical difficulties there at the beginning, but I think we, we powered through it. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, and we do, have, uh, we do have some time for questions. You can send those through, and we will, we will uh, try and get to as many of those as possible. And um, so again, just use the Q&A function. Um, I, I don't see any yet, but we'll give it a few minutes. Um, Dr. Potter, thank you so much. I, I know um, everyone really enjoyed this one. Uh, for those of you watching, I know we had the the um, transcription on, and unfortunately the, the, the robot that was doing it seemed to really struggle with some of the names. So we will try and fix those, at least in a typed transcript. I will have to get a get some of those names from Dr. Potter, so we will we'll address that so you can see those. Um, I do have a couple, a couple names, a couple questions that have come in here. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Potter, are you aware of any native peoples or native First Americans specifically in the Montgomery County area? Are you able to provide some names? I know there was a lot of movement in the area, but uh... well, <clears throat> interestingly enough, when John Smith first explored the Potomac River in 1608. The area above the falls of the Potomac, all the way to um, oh, where uh, Point of Rocks is, was uh, based on our archaeological evidence uninhabited. Uh, there are a number of reasons that archaeologists and anthropologists think that was, this was so, uh, in part because at that time the Five Nation Iroquois. Uh, were on a rampage and they had extended their power as far south as the area uh, that we now call uh, the Potomac Valley. And so the area that would today be <clears throat> Old Valley Route 11 uh, was a uh, American Indian interstate if you will, with groups from the north, specifically the Five Nation Iroquois, going south to trounce on traditional enemies uh, in Virginia and further south. And it was the reverse for other southern groups like Catawba, who were coming north to uh, make war against uh, their enemies that were farther south from where they lived. Uh, but the archaeological evidence in Montgomery County uh, during uh, all of prehistory was an incredible place. Uh, the number of archaeological sites uh, through prehistory from the earliest inhabitants of the Potomac Valley, roughly 15,500 years ago, um, all the way up until the very late uh, 16th century, uh, was very populated. Uh, lots of folks. I had had an earlier question, Matt. I believe that uh, someone wanted to know uh, what my thought was on the name Seneca. 
Yes. Yeah, I do. And I've I've got a num someone else asking about that in the questions too. So the Seneca Creek. Well, <clears throat> um, they, I believe that their question uh, went something like, um, uh, is it uh, a, was it named Seneca because groups of Seneca speaking, uh, Iroquois and speaking Indians from the Five Nation Iroquois called the Seneca, were, had they camped there? Or was it a, a descriptor of the place uh, on the landscape? And most of my <clears throat> anthropological and linguistic colleagues uh, believe that Seneca in this case um, is a descriptor of a feature on the landscape, a place of many rocks and uh, did not derive its name uh, simply because the Seneca at some point had camped in the area. Okay. Um, so obviously I had quite a few people asking about the, you know, uh, Native Americans in Montgomery County, which you answered. Someone asks, have you written a book about the region? Yes. Uh, that wasn't put in my brief uh, description, but uh, the title of my book is um, uh, Commoners, Tribute, and Chiefs, the Development of Algonquian Culture in the Potomac Valley. It was published by the University Press of Virginia. Okay. I've got a number of other books and articles that I've written on a whole host of topics. Uh, believe it or not, I, I go from uh, my great interest in the first Americans uh, all the way up through uh, particularly fascinated by the 16th and 17th centuries um, and European explorations and its effect on native peoples. Talk about pandemics. I mean, the... <clears throat> little vectors that the invading Europeans unleashed on American Indians um, devastated their populations throughout the Americas uh, in ways that we can't even comprehend today. Um, and then I'm also uh, very interested in, in the history and archaeology of the American Civil War. So I, I have a, a lot of different interests and experiences uh, during my 40 odd years of being a professional archaeologist. Okay. Um, someone asks, which Indian nations were the main allies of the French in 1754? <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, well, I suppose that's a, a perfect question to ask, given that we've got the famous painting of uh, General Braddock being mortally wounded uh, during the first uh, opening salvo of what would become the, the first world war, the French and Indian. Um, boy, so <clears throat> there were quite a few, of course, in what is today Canada. Uh, those that would be um, closer to home here, uh, the Shawnee, uh, the Delawares um, were uh, staunch uh, allies of the French uh, in the French and Indian War. And uh, they continue to, interestingly enough, <laughs> flip-flop. And after uh, <clears throat> the American Revolution began, those same peoples uh, supported the British against the colonists. Um, Kentucky uh, was a county in the then newly created uh, state of Virginia uh, during the American Revolution. And um, in 1777, it, that, that time period were called the Bloody Sevens because uh, there were so many attacks from uh, groups uh, in the area of the Midwest and, and Great Lakes regions, uh, not just the uh, Delawares and the Shawnees, but uh, a variety of, of groups farther uh, to the area uh, west of uh, Kentucky and what is now uh, uh, Indiana, Illinois, uh, and then up around the Great Lakes. Okay. Um, someone asks, what cultural issues prevented all or most of the coastal tribes from consolidating into a very large cooperative military alliance sufficient to push the colonists out of all the coastal territory? 
<clears throat> well, <clears throat> a number of people have pondered that question. Uh, the group that was the most organized, the most centralized in at the time of the beginning of the English exploration and settling of the Middle Atlantic were the Powhatans, uh, the groups that uh, lived in Tidewater, Virginia, particularly concentrated in the area from the Fall Line to Chesapeake Bay and along the James and North Rivers. And it was such, I think, um, a jarring, a startling experience to see these folks just rather arrogantly plop down in the middle of <clears throat> territory that was already being occupied, perhaps caused them to step back a bit. But then they, they saw, hey, first off, <laughs> these strangers were the women, because initially there were no women at Jamestown. Jamestown uh, didn't get women to come there for a number of years after it was first settled. And so the Native Americans saw this and said, God, you know, they don't have any women. They don't know how to take care of themselves. They're coming to us to feed them. Hence all the reason that uh, they were coming to the Powhatan groups to trade for corn. Um, and they just didn't initially, I believe, um, certainly Powhatan, see them as a real threat. But after a couple of years <clears throat> of uh, on again, off again, uh, peaceful relations with them, um, it reached the point when the, the English then started becoming more aggressive in their policy to you know, take the corn by force and to then, worse yet, try and destroy the Powhatan people's religion and religious beliefs. That, that sort of tipped it off <clears throat> into uh, just open warfare. And that's really what caused the first Anglo-Powhatan War. Okay, um, so I have someone who says, uh, I think of Margaret Brent, Margaret Brent and the role she played. What is your assessment in, in her role in uh, English colonization? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, well, that was quite interesting given who her brother was. Um, but uh, I uh, don't know that I can speak at length about that, um, other than to say that uh, she certainly um, tried to broker uh, better relations between folks on both sides of the River Virginia, uh, of the River Virginia and Maryland, as well as between um, the different groups. And of course, <clears throat> she had uh, married in, as it were, um, to the Piscataways, um, and it was very, uh, it was a very interesting time that uh, she lived and the influence that, that she uh, tried to bring to bear to the issues that were critical at the time that uh, she was around, which was, you know, later than what I've been uh, dealing with most of, of my talk. But uh, yeah, she was uh, quite a person. Okay, I have a couple of people who've pointed out that uh, Seneca Creek is actually labeled as Senegar, um, spelled either S-E-N-E-G-A-R or S-I-N-E-G-A-R on early maps. So there, it, it's possible there was some sort of you know um, translation thing that happened there or transcription error. So well, part of the problem is that everything was phonetic. Number one. Number two, the English still wasn't a standardized language as far as for writing it. Um, and yes, I mean, <clears throat> how many different variations do you want of Seneca? Um, I would suggest you go <clears throat> to uh, volume 15 of the Handbook of North American Indians published by the Smithsonian Institution Press. 
and see how many different spellings of what today we spell S-E-N-E-C-A-E, -E, Seneca, it's amazing. Um, there are a lot. All right. That's, well, a, that's another reason why it is probably uh, a name used here as a description of a feature on the landscape, a place of many rocks. And it makes more sense there. Um, the other reason that it's spelled so many different ways is it, it depends on are you using it as a landscape descriptor or are you using it as the name of an Iroquoian speaking group and <clears throat> for the latter uh, there are almost as many variations of that spelling as there are of it as being a, a descriptor of a place on the landscape okay um, next question I have here is, there is some thought that the river road may have once been an indigenous travel route. Were there any other early overland transportation routes in the county? And so in the Montgomery, uh, or I guess this area of Maryland. I'll start by saying that wherever there was a river crossing in historic times, you can better believe that it was a crossing in prehistory. So that all of these routes, um, that uh, the major routes that we know today were probably on the prehistoric landscape. Um, so for example, uh, Route 11, <laughs> uh, the Carolina Road, um, all of those places that were here when they were first documented by the English settlers, or if you're going farther up the river, the first settlers actually uh, into the upper Potomac were actually Swedes, uh, which sort of blows some people's mind. But uh, yeah, they were settling in places that had been known and traversed for thousands of years. And so, yes, uh, so many of, of the major routes that we know today uh, were in existence uh, long before the, the first uh, sails billowed uh, over the waters of the Chesapeake. Okay, uh, Dr. Potter, I'm gonna, I forgot to ask you to turn your video camera on, so I'm gonna do that right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I apologize on that. Oh, uh, that's all right. I prefer, like I said, being behind the <laughs> All right. I think people are wanting to, to see um, to see your face a little bit. So we'll give them a little bit of that for a few moments. Um, OK, so I have a couple. Let's see. We got a, I've got a lot of questions here. I'm trying to get to as many as I can. Uh, as a reminder, we will have recordings of these sessions available to the premier ticket holders. If you'd like to upgrade your ticket, you can certainly send an email to history conference at um, montgomeryhistory.org. Um, okay, let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, so, so is there any evidence of, uh, I'm going to already, I know I'm going to mess up the name, the Nakach Tank, Tank. Tank Kingdom influence extending from Tidewater Potomac River up to Rock Creek and or Cabin John? If so, how far? Well, uh, very good question, as all of these have been. The best we know is that the Nakach Tanks area of influence in the early 1600s would have been focused around the fall line, uh, primarily on the Maryland and DC sides. As you got to understand that there were other Algonquian speaking peoples living on the opposite bank of the Potomac River in what is now Virginia. And while there is both ethno-historical and archeological evidence to suggest that the, the two groups on the Virginia side of the river opposite what would be today um, Prince George's County and the District of Columbia uh, were at one time apparently part of a larger political group. 
So you had the patalomics and the toxinates, later spelled toxinate to tox, tox to tog, tog to dog. I mean, it goes all over the place. Um, and the groups uh, then that would have been like in the Koch tanks uh, opposite them. And then uh, by the time Smith comes up the river in 1608, as I said earlier, um, <clears throat> the Nakach tanks and the Piscataways, and at that time when Smith explored the river in 1607-08, the Nakach tanks apparently um, viewed the Tayak of the Piscataway as their paramount chief also, but that was a rocky relationship. And so later, uh, the Nakach tanks uh, sort of became independent, particularly when they became the middlemen for the Iroquois and speaking Massawomics who lived somewhere up uh, north and to the Northwest of what is now Washington, DC. Uh, probably in that corner of where Maryland and Pennsylvania come together. Uh, Maryland almost getting pinched out as, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, uh, once it became a colony, expanded in that area. Um, so it's uh, best to say that the Nakach tanks area of influence would have been um, Prince George's County up through the District of Columbia uh, and perhaps over into, uh, but never really significantly uh, a part of, of Frederick County. Okay, uh, next question I have here, kind of segued into it a little bit. Um, on John Smith's 1612 map, there's a cross on a hill above the Potomac River, north of the bend of the river where DC is today. The cross is in what is Montgomery County today. Do yes. you know what it signified? Oh yes, that's um, the the Maltese crosses uh, on John Smith's famous map of Virginia uh, indicate the area that he personally explored, and anything beyond those Maltese crosses, he quote had by relation of the natives in quote. So anything past the Maltese crosses on his map, he learned of from the American Indians themselves. He did not personally go beyond that area. So everything else within the Maltese crosses, it's areas that uh, he personally explored. He was the, uh, one of the earliest um, explorers and map makers to actually do that. I've got an article that I wrote because I, I just find I'm, I'm very interested in cartography. I have talks on that. One, uh, rethinking Captain John Smith's map of Virginia, uh, which of course includes a, a basically the greater Chesapeake region. And um, I find uh, his explorations and his map uh, very fascinating and have been a student in, of it for many years. Okay, um, let's see, I'll find the next question here that I thought was kind of interesting. So other than maize and pelts, what items were part of trade from the native people? Um, the the uh, pelts came in a little later. And in the initial items for trade uh, <clears throat> were primarily corn, <clears throat> because the English weren't capable of, weren't focusing on uh, feeding themselves uh, initially. And they spent a lot of time looking for other stuff like gold, silver, and uh, <clears throat> squabbling among themselves. Uh, Jamestown was not a particularly nice place to be uh, during the first couple of years of, of its uh, existence, that's for sure. Okay. But um, it's only later um, that the English really 
get interested in other things. So they were primarily searching for, you know, resources that they could exploit and ship back to England. Uh, and they really didn't need the American Indians to do that. Okay. Um, next question I have here is, did the various tribes communicate easily with each other or were their language differences profound? So I've been talking about um, all these different language families and, and for the Potomac Valley, we know um, that for the area from what is today, the Great Falls down to the mouth of the river, uh, that all the groups along its bank spoke a dialect of Eastern Algonquian that was mutually intelligible. When you start talking about other Algonquian speaking peoples uh, farther north, like the Delaware, most of the conversation between a Powhatan and a Delaware could be understood, but not every phrase or every word was translatable, but the majority of it was. And when you start talking then about Iroquoian speakers, forget it. So <clears throat> Algonquians, in, unless they made a, a uh, purposely wanted to learn Iroquois and an Iroquoian language so that they could translate and be a translator or a trader to other groups among their own people. Uh, there's no evidence in history where uh, Algonquians who became prisoners of Iroquoian peoples learned Iroquoian, but there's plenty of evidence to indicate where Iroquoian peoples picked up Algonquian. Uh, so in our area, um, you have three major American Indian language families, <clears throat> Algonquian, and there are different dialects of Algonquian, but most of them are mutually intelligible. Iroquoian, I'll forget that, <clears throat> The Algonquian speaking peoples aren't going to understand the Iroquoian and their dialects of that. And then Siouan. And so the Monahoaks and the Monacans that lived in Piedmont, Virginia, uh, spoke a totally different American Indian language. So you had three major American Indian language families all in this area. Um, and uh, it, it made for interesting times, to say the least. Okay. Uh, someone asks, what was the fate of the Delaware? When were they forced or did they choose to move, move further west in the face of English encroachment or what pushed them? They were forced by the English. And in a not too kind way, even though... Uh, a number of treaties were signed with them over and over and over again. Yeah, so, you know, their homeland, uh, when the Europeans first came in this area, was in a place it was named for them, the Delaware Valley. And um, by the time all was said and done, they were pushed all over the place uh, at the beginning of the French and Indian War. Um, they're part of them are, are in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and then they're pushed farther to the west, and they wind up uh, in what would today be Ohio on the other side of the Ohio River. Um, they were, uh, they got a raw deal, to say the least. And of course, their descendants now are uh, in what was Oklahoma Territory, so there are Delawares living in Oklahoma, uh, in the Midwest, and they're there because their ancestors were pushed there as a result of all the treaty violations and other <clears throat> more or less dirty deals that 
Uh, we're done to them. Okay. Um, someone says, I know about Swedes at Elkton, Maryland, but did you say there were also early Swedes in the upper Potomac area? Yes. Old Town, Maryland, and places just south of it. Uh, there were two brothers with the last name, uh, and this was not their original Swedish name, but their last name is Friend, F-R-I-E-N-D, with a capital F. And uh, uh, so uh, one of the earliest settlers in what is today Frederick County, Maryland, had the last name of Friend. And uh, then his brother uh, later settled uh, farther upriver in the area of what is now Old Town. And they were both uh, traders uh, trading with the uh, local American Indians. So uh, there was, it's really fascinating. Um, we found, uh, when we were doing archeological work at Monocacy National Battlefield, which has a lot more on its landscape than just what was left as a result of the Civil War battle. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, we, we found a, um, a Swedish taller, T-H-A-L-E-R, and if that sounds a lot like dollar, well, and I see that the uh, little thing that's doing all the spelling, it's yeah, <laughs> T-H-A-L-E-R, taller. So we found a, a, a Swedish taller uh, in the archaeological work that we did at Monocacy National Battlefield. It's kind of funny to see, even after spelling it, it turns out Swedish tower <laughs> rather than Swedish dollar or taller. <laughs> anyway. Well, audibly, it, it will, we'll get the correct spelling. Oh, me. that's all right. Yeah, I'll work <laughs> with you on that. All right. Um, so the next question I have here, someone asks, have you read the, I, I believe it's the Sotweed Factor by John Barth? Oh, heavens, how could anybody living or working in Chesapeake as an anthropologist, archaeologist, or historian not? Yeah. It's great. I love it. Okay. I was a teenager when I first read that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, next question here. Um, during the wars, what did the Indian or Native Americans do with their captives? The English? What did the English do with their captives? Uh, okay. So I reckon, are we, are we going to talk about the wars that were going on in the uh, 1600s? I, they didn't specify, uh, but mm -hmm. let's, sure, let's go with the 1600s. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, oftentimes they, they would eventually be exchanged. Uh, but things got nastier as the 1600s went on. And so once... English settlement of the Chesapeake region started to go off the charts uh, by particularly uh, the time of Bacon's Rebellion. Many of the groups in Virginia uh, who fought against the Virginia English were taken captive and then shipped out of the area. Uh, many of them sold as slaves uh, to work in the Caribbean uh, on uh, plantations. So, yeah, Virginia, was, uh, among American Indians in the area of what we today would call Maryland, Virginia, uh, and the District of Columbia, they all agreed that of the English in the area, Maryland or Virginia, the American Indians would much rather have dealt with the Maryland English than the Virginia English. The Virginia English did not have a good reputation among American Indians, particularly in the 1600s. Okay. Uh, someone asks, uh, 
was was all these or all these relationships with the native populations also complicated by the fight between the English royalists and Parliament during this time? Um. Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. Okay. Uh, that I, I think I mentioned during the course of my uh, discussion that uh, when uh, Opakantanu became aware of the English Civil War, uh, he felt that's that's why he uh, chose to attack the last time uh, because he thought that the English would be weak. Um, as a result of the conflicts going on across the pond. And uh, yeah, there were differences. And then uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is um, during the time of Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia, um, there was a schism between the royal governor and his supporters and Bacon and his backcountry supporters which carried over across the pond and made the resolution of that conflict uh, more dicey. Okay, uh, let's see, we've got a couple other questions here. Um, someone says, William Henry Holmes did a lot of archaeology in Montgomery County. What do you think is the most significant site related to woodland groups here at Contact? Uh, well, Holmes personally didn't do all that much in Montgomery County. Some of his surrogates did, um, but most of Holmes's work uh, focused on the area from Washington, D.C. and the great quarry sites, uh, not only in Rock Creek Park and other parts of the district, but also over into Virginia where you have outcrops of uh, soapstone in the area around Clifton, Virginia, and then downriver. Uh, so Holmes's focus actually was was from Washington D.C. Uh, downriver to the mouth, and then uh, up around various places along the bay. Um, he had a number of, of colleagues that worked for him who did much of the field work under his auspices, uh, such as William Dinwiddie. Uh, and then also Gerard Falk, F-O-W-E-K-E. -E. Um, but uh, Holmes's greatest contribution uh, was the collections that he made in the District of Columbia, because most of those sites are gone now, along the Anacostia, and then um, down and around the bay. Uh, he's the one that uh, did explorations of the huge shell mound or shell midden at Pope's Creek, Maryland. Uh, he, of course, also did uh, the work at the Piney Branch Quarry site in the heart of Washington, D.C. Um, and his one of his greatest works um, are stone implements of the Potomac Chesapeake Tidewater which is a huge tome that was done in the late 19th century uh, as a publication through the Bureau of American Ethnology. Okay, you mentioned the Anacosta. Someone says, what is the origin of, of the names Anacosta? And I believe it's Anna Lawston, the first name of Mason's Island, today's Roosevelt, Roosevelt Island. Anna Lawston and Anacostia are American Indian names that have been anglicized and Latinized beyond all recognition. Okay. So believe it or not, all the both of those names <clears throat> derive from Nakatchtank. Again, I would recommend for folks that are interested in this um, to get uh, their hands on uh, volume 15. A handbook of North American Indians published by the Smithsonian. And um, there's a whole section in there on the Kanoi, C-O-N-O-Y, uh, uh, 
a Iroquoian term for the groups that we know as the Piscataway. Um, and there's a, a really nice section on the changes in and derivations of the group place names. And one of those that's discussed in there is Nakach Tank. So it goes something like Nakach Tank, Anakach Tank, Anacostia, Analosta. You know, very simplistic progression that I, I'm not doing it enough justice. And that's why I refer you to the uh, chapter in volume 15 of the Handbook of North American Indians. Okay. Um, someone asks, were there any Indian mounds in uh, Montgomery County? No. Okay. Simple, quick answer. Okay. Yes, <laughs> for once. <laughs> um, uh, what do you, what, someone asked, what do you think is the most interesting archaeological site in Montgomery County? Oh, man. Uh, that's a loaded question. I'm sure you, you'll make someone upset if you say one thing. <laughs> Oh, I, I have no doubt. Well, we did, when I was the regional archaeologist uh, for a little over 36 years, we did a nine-year archaeological and historical study of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal from tidelock to terminus. And the American Indian sites that we found in what is today Montgomery County were pretty amazing. Uh, but there, I'm not going to be able to throw out a name that's going to have instant public recognition. Um, but suffice to say that Montgomery County, like Frederick County, uh, has everything from Paleo Indian with uh, fluted points, and uh, which are the calling card of the peoples who were the first first Americans in the Potomac Valley, um, all the way up to um, you know when uh, the organized groups that had once lived here uh, were no longer present. Uh, I mean, you got. 15,500 years of American Indian occupation along particularly uh, the Potomac River in Montgomery and Frederick counties. We were hoping to try and find an archeological site in that portion of the Piedmont Potomac that had preserved deposits that went back to the very earliest first Americans in this area. Uh, we came close, but no brass ring. Uh, we got to around eh, 8,800 BC. Uh, so we were in what we would call today as an archeologist, the early archaic period, A-R-A-C-H-A-I. I don't think this, the robot's gonna get that one, but. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll Archaic. Right down. Yeah. Yes. yeah. We'll take okay. Care. Um, okay. Uh, so the the next question I have here, and we'll, I'm going to just do this one, and then one more question, um, and then we'll wrap things up uh, so everybody can stretch their legs for the next sessions. But um, Dr. Potter, can you can you kind of tell us about your journey to become a professional archaeologist of this area? What what uh, triggered your interest? Uh, how you came to be who you are today? Mm. Well, uh, now, I, keep in mind, we only have a few minutes left. <laughs> yes, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. So for those who want the short version, um, I was uh, privileged to be one of the first people interviewed for first person singular in the Sunday Washington Post. And uh, the <clears throat> short version is my mom's mom, my grandmother on my mom's side, uh, was a great storyteller. And she would tell me stories that had been related to her by her grandfather. 
And one day I was walking with my, her husband, my grandfather, uh, in the family barnyard near Culpeper, Virginia. And there had been a heavy rain the day before, and we were walking along the edge of a building that had a, uh, a, a long overhang and quite a eroded drip line beneath the overhang of the roof. And Granddaddy <clears throat> was a very tall, big boned man. And he kicked up something with the toe of his left riding boot and told me to pick it up. And I did. And it was rather heavy for its size. It also, to my eyes at that time, looked like a gray blob. And it turns out it was a bullet <clears throat> from the American Civil War. And I asked my granddaddy, I said, is this from the time that Grandmother tells me about great, great, great granddaddy's exploits in the Civil War. And he said yes. And that's when the light bulb went on in my wee little head uh, between the times of my ancestors who are no longer with me and the fact that I could pick up some tangible evidence from their times in my time. And so uh, I was sort of hooked and I've always been interested in people. So I, you know, my interest goes to uh, all you have to be is a card carrying member of humanity for me to be interested in the archeology span of people of the past. And uh, so that's why I like doing both prehistoric and historic archeology span and uh, you know, as long as they're a card-carrying member of humanity, I'm interested in their past. Okay. All right. So the last question I have, um, it's, it's a little bit of a two-parter, um, but uh, the um, if, for those who are interested in learning more about archaeological findings in Montgomery County, what do you, where do you suggest they look? And along with that, is there any you mentioned the you know the Smithsonian volume on uh, Native American Indi North American Indians? Is there other suggested reading that you would you would well, well suggest for people? Matt, I think it would be best for me to provide you with that information that you okay. can you know post or do whatever absolutely you want to we can emanate to because uh, it's a great question and and I want to do right by it. Okay. And, given the the translator here <laughs> fair I, enough I, I think it would be best for me to provide it to you okay so what we'll do with that is we'll um i'll be in touch with you dr potter and you can send me a list and we will post that on our website uh, for those who have purchased tickets we'll put that up um with that we're going to go ahead and wrap things up um i there's i know everybody has so many questions i wish we could stay here forever um but we do have to get ready for our next sessions and uh, i need to stretch my legs um, so, and, and I'm sure everybody's probably getting a little hungry. So Dr. Potter, any closing words before we finish up today? Uh, again, it's been a, a, a privilege and a pleasure. My apologies once more for the rocky road beginning, uh, but uh, I hope that the rest of the presentation was of interest. And I wanna thank everyone for inviting me to participate.